I'm Pastor Josh Pylan. It's so good to be here with you this morning. I love any time I get to come and talk. We're going to have a, a good time here today. Uh, I'm actually on staff as a pastor full time, and I will be celebrating this year having been on staff for five years. This is so great. Man, it, it's been a wild ride, okay? And, and when I first came on, I was untested and inexperienced. Uh, and, and actually, I, don't, I wanted to tell you, I told you it's a brand new story. It's totally true. This is why I have to tell it. Uh, but just before I got hired, I failed a personality test. <laughs> I didn't even know that was an option. I thought they were going to tell me what kind of personality I had. Not, this is not a pass-fail. It turns out I don't have one. I don't know. I've taken it. To, it's scientifically proven. I don't have a personality. And so when I came into the church, man, I was a little nervous. I was like, these guys are hiring someone who don't even have a personality. Okay. <laughs> They took a risk on me, and I'm so grateful for the leadership in our house that they saw potential in me, that they saw value in me, and they've called me into higher leadership. And so I just want to take a moment before we begin just just honor the leadership in the house. It's so great. It's so good. Hey, uh, we at Joy Church are on a journey in Christ. Our journey comes in four parts. We're here to know God, to find freedom, to discover purpose, and to make a difference. And we really believe that no matter where you are on that journey, there's a next step for you. As Haley said, we've been in a season of prayer and fasting. For the 21 days, we've been seeking after the Lord. We've been connecting with the Lord. We've had amazing prayer mornings. We've had some of the best and most impactful worship times just coming and really seeking after the Lord. We gave out resources like the Pray First book or the Pray First app, which is free to download. And it's just been incredible. And, and what I want to do today is I want to encourage you this. Whatever God has spoken to you, whatever he's said to you, if you've had moments in his presence, don't let that end. Okay, we've pressed in for the 21 days, but we want this to be a year where God's presence is felt, a year where God connects with us. And so if I could encourage you with anything, you, you, don't let it end. If you could let me pastor you this morning, it's, it, you have a next step. And the way that you continue this on, the way you continue the momentum, the hard-won momentum that you've already won in 21 days of prayer and fasting is to get connected into a life group. Our life group's actually launched today. It's the official first day, so you maybe saw the people out there with the cookies. How many of you guys have been to a life group before? Just by show of hands. All right, come on. You know the value. This is, this is amazing. Look at these guys, the wonderful life group team. These guys have passion for it. We love them. <laughs> Yeah, baby. Oh, man, it's so good. It's so good. I love life groups. I'm super passionate about it. They're on our life groups team. They're passionate. You know why? Here's why. Let me tell you, this is not a brand new design. We didn't come up with this. We're not that good. This is actually the pattern given to us by the early church. It says in Acts 5, it says, every day in the temple and from house to house, meaning they got together like this. They had a corporate gathering like this. And then they broke out and they went to homes and they had meals and they had prayer and they had encouragement. And they did these things all around the city as the new church was launching off. So we're not running a new idea. We're running the same idea, the pattern of the early church. So I want to invite you. If you're in a season where you're like, man, God has been good in these 21 days. It's been powerful. God has been speaking to me. I want to continue that momentum with a life group. There are friends waiting for you in a life group. I actually, uh, I got to meet and and get to know one of my closest friends. His name is Casey. Casey's awesome, man. He encouraged me. He loves me. We went and had coffee the other day just sitting and just connecting about ministry and dreaming about the things that God was going to do in this year and really just talking about all that could happen. And, And it was just powerful. And Proverbs says that if you walk with the wise, you'll become wise. It says, as one uh, iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens another. And so uh, if you're in a spot where you're like, man, I need that. I need a better friend circle. If, are, are your friends praying for you? Are they challenging you to grow in Christ? Are they pushing you along on the journey? Because if they're not, I'm going to just say it. Maybe it's time for some new friends. And you're going to find some in a life group. Not only do we get to go to church, but through life groups, we get to be the church. There was a beautiful moment in a life group. I'm going to share the story with you real quick, and then we'll jump into the message. But uh, Heidi, she was one of the ones running on the banner. She's crazy, and I love her. And she was telling me, she goes, in our group, we normally get together, and we have, like, you know, friend connection. We, like, do dinner, and we hang out. And, and she said, but one day, the Holy Spirit just spoke to our hearts as a lead team, and we, did, we just felt like the Lord was calling us in that life group to pray over the kids. And so they stopped the life group. They said, hey, we don't normally do this, but we just feel like the Lord's leading us. 
is it cool if we just brought the kids in? And they did. They brought them in, and they, as leaders, they, they laid hands on them, and they started to pray over them. And, and it released something in their life. I'm telling you, there are spiritual breakthroughs still yet unrecognized in 2024 for you if you'll press in and you'll connect. And so I want to challenge you this morning. Sign up. There's groups all over town. There's groups all over the week. There's groups in every location. Don't worry. We've got one for you. You can be a part of that today. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm off my, my thing. Okay. I feel like you guys have sat with me long enough to understand I'm going to be totally honest with you today. So I used to, this, is, this might not be something you've heard from a pastor. I used to really not like prayer. Like, I really struggle with prayer. I'm, one, I'm a little ADD. And two, like, I would just, I wanted to pray, okay? I had the desire. But I would, I would get in there, and I would start praying, and about five minutes in, I ran out of cousins. Like, I just don't have that many family. How am I supposed to pray for more people? I don't know more people. I'm like, God, I want to pray, but I don't really know how to pray. And I would hear from these super spiritual people talking about how they, they had been in the presence of God, and they'd had these deep, long, powerful prayer moments, and I hated their guts for it. Okay, let's be honest. I was like, I don't even like talking to you about prayer. And I started to get like, man, I, I wanted that. I wanted that relationship with God. I wanted to have these deep, powerful, impactful moments. I read in the Bible where God would talk and he would, he would speak out these like really detailed instructions. I didn't want a vague whisper from God. I wanted words from God. I wanted to hear something powerful and impactful from God. And I thought, what am I doing wrong? And maybe you're in a spot today where you're thinking, man, I, I'm there. Like, I don't, I don't pray the way that these other people, these para, super spiritual prayer people pray. When I pray, it feels super disconnected, and I get ADD, and I see something shiny, and I just can't do it. Maybe you are in that spot today, and, and what I want to help you along with is that the relationship that you've always wanted is not going to be found in another boyfriend, not in another husband, not in a new pet. Okay, the relationship that you've always wanted is with the living God, and it's going to be found in God's presence it's not about going to church more. It's not about giving away all your money. It's not about going to a life group even. All those are good things, but they're not the thing. The thing is that you would get in the presence of a living God, that you would connect with him relationally, and you would see something amazing happen in this year, and I want to see that for each and every one of you. I want to see Joy Church, our heart as a lead team is to see Joy Church brought into a deeper understanding of God in this year. It's why we tithe the first bit of the year, why we set aside and dedicate the first bit of the year that something new and fresh and life-giving would be brought out in this year. Are you with me? Yes. All right, let's jump in. Okay. Uh, in 2023, my prayer life was literally revolutionized. It was. It was totally changed, all because of a prayer model. And the prayer model is, is really, really incredible because it's not like, hey, if you say this incantation, if you say this, what they would call it is a rote prayer. It's not like, hey, if you just say the right words, God will meet you. That's not it. What we're looking at and what's spelled out in the Pray First app and in the Pray First book is a pattern of prayer. That through this pattern of prayer, you might actually connect with God in a brand new way. So I'm not giving you out a, a spell to meet Jesus. That's not what this is. I'm giving you out a pattern that God has shown himself in Scripture that through this pattern, we might pray our own words in our own heart and connect with him in a new way. And when 2023, I started to do that. I started following these prayer models. I started praying these incredible prayers. And over the course of that year, I became one of those super spiritual prayer people. Who'd have thought? And if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. I believe that. I believe that God wants to revolutionize your prayer life this year. And so I have some tools. I have some things that I'm going to give you today that if you, would, if you would just take them and adopt them, you'd be in a brand new way. Okay? Now, we have a lot of different models spelled out in the book, but I'm going to give you my favorite. And you may find as you study through the book, as you look on the app, as you study prayer models, that you have a different favorite that's fine. You're wrong, but that's fine. Okay? This is my favorite, and I have the microphone, so I'm talking. No. <laughs> so 
Here's what it is. It's a, it's a pattern. And the pattern we're going to study is found in Exodus 25. That's in the Old Testament. You can get out your phone Bible. You can open it. Does anybody have a paper Bible? Is there a single person? Paper Bible right here. Yes. Oh, my paper Bible people. Get a paper Bible. I love it. Uh, we're going to be in Exodus 25. It's in the first half of the Bible in the Old Testament. And we're going to study what's called the tabernacle prayer model. Now, the tabernacle was uh, something I have to explain to you because it's not something we totally know and understand. The tabernacle was a house for God. So we're going to go back to the story where God freed the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. He brought them out of Egyptian slavery after uh, hundreds of years in in Egypt. And he said, hey, I'm going to bring you into the promised land. But the problem is they failed to get into the promised land. They went out, and instead of entering and taking and dominating the promised land, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And when they wandered for those 40 years, God had to amend his plan. See, he was going to have them go into the promised land and build a temple. And what he had to do is he had to make now a mobile version called the tabernacle. And the tabernacle moved with them as they went around the desert for those 40 years. It says in Exodus 25, 8 and 9, God says, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. You must build this, and he uses a brand new word, tabernacle and its furnishings, exactly according to the pattern I will show you. And so God says, I want to live with my people. I want to have a place where I can meet with you, talk with you, connect with you. God says, I want to be with Israel as they wander in this spot. Even when they weren't following God's plan, God still wanted to be with them. And the point I want to make for you today is his instructions are the exact same for you today. God wants a holy sanctuary where his presence might be felt, where his directions might be felt, where he might be able to talk to you and connect with you today just the same as he did in Moses through the son, Jesus Christ. Christ ultimately fulfilled everything that the tabernacle was trying to accomplish that we might connect with him and have his spirit with us right here and right now. Okay, are you guys getting, is this amazing? Are like, are you hearing me? Okay, so the tabernacle of Moses, God prescribed for Moses what he wanted to accomplish, which was a holy place that he might live with his people. And he says in Exodus 25, 9, He says, you must build the tabernacle and its furnishings according to the, say this word with me, pattern. It's a pattern. It's a model. It's a a way in which God wanted to be approached. And as we study through this, you're going to see we're actually going to take that pattern and we're going to bring it into today. Okay? Now, the tabernacle was housed inside of a 150-foot by 75-foot open-air fenced-off court. Some people struggle with that because they're like, why has it got to be a fence around God? Isn't God for everyone? Isn't God supposed to be open? Well, yeah, but the tabernacle is describing how God wants to be approached. He's describing how God wants to be connected with. And if you go through the gates, that's the right way. If you climb over the fence, that's the wrong way. And there were some pretty serious penalties for people who did that. Okay, so God says, I want you to interact with me in this way. God has healthy boundaries, and he's describing those here. Now, the first station that you would come into is right there at the beginning. You can see it down at the bottom. It was this open gate that you would walk into, and and Psalm 100 actually describes how we're supposed to enter into that gate. Okay, it says in Psalm 100, verse 4, it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, Go into his courts, notice the wording, with praise, give him thanks and praise his name. And so this is our first prayer instruction. Right here at the beginning of the tabernacle, outer court, we have our first prayer instruction. We begin with thanksgiving and praise. And I love this section because I love telling God about who he is and what he's done. So my prayer starts off with, man, thank you, God, for everything you've done for me. Thank you, God, for that I have breath in my lungs, that I have a great family who loves me. Thank you, God, that I live in America, such a wonderful free country. Thank you, God, that I have this building over me, that I'm not out in the cold. Thank you, God, that you've provided for me. And then I move into praise. God, you're incredible. No one is like you. God, you're powerful. No one can do what you can do. God, you're omnipresent. You're everywhere. God, you're omniscient. You know everything and I don't. God, you are. God, you are. God, you are. And what's crazy about thanksgiving and praise is that they build momentum. 
You guys think I'm amped up now. You should see me when I pray. Okay, let's go. Come on. Like these, I love it because as you start to get thankful, man, it builds momentum in your prayer. You start to realize there's more to be thankful for. There's more to give God praise for. There's more wonderful expressions of who he is. And so I would say is we start here and we go up. And so what I would ask you today is right at the very beginning, what has God done for you? Do you have clothes? Do you have a, a breath in your lungs? Do you have a family? Do you, has God blessed you in any way? Who is God to you? Is he your healer? Is he your provider? What has God done in your life that you might start and begin by entering in with praise and thanksgiving? Now, as we move past the gates, we go further into the outer court into uh, the first stop, the brazen altar. Okay, so the brazen altar. Now, an altar is not a word we use a lot today. An altar is a fire pit. It's a giant barbecue. God's house smells like the steakhouse. Come on, baby, let's go. This is a religion I can get behind. Uh, the altar was the only barbecue pit I know of bigger than our own. It's seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet. It was huge, okay? And they would come in there, and they would uh, have the Israelites bring young, healthy, unblemished animals God instructed them to place their hands on the animals in a practice called imputation. Not a word we use today. To impute is actually a financial term. It means to credit from one account to another. And what God is saying is here, when you place your hands on these animals, what you're doing is you're taking your sin and placing it on the animal, and you're taking the sinlessness, the righteousness from the animal, and crediting it to your account. Why? God doesn't hate animals Okay, I got to tell the PETA people here. God's not mad at animals, but God never wanted us to forget the price or the cost of sin. God never wanted us to be unaware of the cost of our sin. And so by doing this, we were always aware. Now, Christ has paid our penalty today. I don't, we, the reason we don't sacrifice animals anymore today is because Christ already paid not only my penalty, but everyone's penalty, forward and back. He did it all at the cross. And so I walk in freedom today, which is why this is the second stop for us at the brazen altar, where we remember the cross of Jesus. In fact, it says in uh, Romans 8, 23, or yeah, 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So I bought, was owed, paid for sin and death. And the only reason that I didn't receive it is because there was a shipping delay. Amazon Prime, they said two days, it came later. There was a delay from the time in which sin was introduced into my life and I die. And in the gap between those two moments, I met Christ. And Christ took everything, all the sin and all the shame and all the problems for me, and he actually imputed to me his righteousness. When God looks at me, he sees Christ's righteousness. Now, when we pray at this section, what, what I do is we take a little bit of time and we remember the cross. We remember the cost of our freedom. Uh, it's not a very uplifting time in the prayer, but it's the most important time for us to remember in the prayer. It's the most important one because because of what Christ has done, I have the free gift of eternal life. Okay, so, so far we've entered into the gates of thanksgiving. We stopped at the brazen altar to remember Christ's sacrifice to purchase our freedom. And next we move on to the laver. We don't have totally an appreciation for how dirty uh, life is when you walk everywhere in leather sandals. If you have Birkenstocks, maybe you get it. But the rest of us have these shoes. We do this now. But when you walked everywhere, and, and only the wealthy really could afford, you know, camels, horses, donkeys to ride in, everybody else walked in everything that was left behind from the candle, you know, donkeys and horses. And so it was disgusting. And you would walk in these filthy dirt roads. The wind would kick up and the dust would get on. And you, the sweat and the grime and the grossness of travel was really, really rough. And you would walk in to the tabernacle court, and here would be this giant bowl filled with cool, crisp, clean water. And for the first time in all of your travels, you would wash your hands and your feet and you would feel clean. I mean, it was, it was, it was a moment. The bottom of the bowl was mirrored. 
So that not only did they clean themselves physically, but God actually was speaking over them saying, I want to cleanse you spiritually as well. And so at this station, we take time to to be cleansed by God, to be moved and cleansed by the work of the Holy Spirit. It says in Psalm 139, he says, search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. He says, point out anything in me that offends you. And lead me in the path of everlasting life. So when I reach this point of the prayer model, I take time and say, God, is, is there anything in me that you don't want in me? Is there anything that I have, God, that you don't want to be inside of my heart or in my life around me? And if something just leapt to your mind, that's the thing. Okay? If there's something when you walk into this station, you're like, I hope God doesn't ask about, that's it. That's the thing. He would go, you're going to have to get rid of that. I prayed this one time, I, I, as I said, in 2023, I did this pattern a lot. I prayed this prayer a lot. And as I went to this station one time, uh, I was like, Lord, is there anything in me that shouldn't be in me? And he said, yes, Josh, there's a spirit of gluttony on your life. I thought, ooh, that's bad. He goes, yeah, it's bad. I said, well, how do we get rid of it? And, and God said, it's, it's very simple. You have to crucify the flesh. I said, Lord, what does that mean? He goes, well, when you crucify something, you beat it into submission, you shame it, and you nail it to the cross. And I said, what does that look like in my life? I'm going to need some next steps, God. Well, how do I do this? He said, Josh, I want you to do 60 days without baked bread. I said, God, we have a bad connection. I didn't quite hear you correctly. <laughs> I've never argued with a prayer more in my life. And I did 60 days. Okay, full disclosure. I broke once in the middle for pizza. Okay. <laughs> This confession felt good for me. I needed it. It's good. It's good. I did 60 days. And you know what I noticed afterwards? I still eat more than I ought to, okay? You don't get this body type eating away like skinny people eat. And if you've had lunch with me, you know I probably eat more than I ought to. But after doing this, I became more aware of when the spirit of gluttony was working in my life. And now I see the spiritual implications of it, and I am doing the work still. I'm on the glutton-free diet, if you want to. Here we go. Okay. It was something in me that God didn't want in me. Psalm 19 says it this way. He says, uh, how can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me, God, from these hidden faults. There are things in your heart that you maybe don't even know about. And when you come before the laver and you lay things on the altar and you say, God, everything in me, everything around my life, every relationship, every friendship, every thought, belief, and heartfelt thing that I have, it's all subject to you, God. Is there anything that needs to go? Be willing to do it. Christ actually said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. He said, be willing to take extreme measure. Okay. Now, after that, We move further in. He does this, by the way, not to punish us, but to prepare us for a greater measure of the Holy Spirit, which is the next station, the lampstand. Okay, so here we enter in to the tabernacle, the actual tent inside of the outer court. The tent was massive. It was 45 feet long, 27 feet deep, 15 feet high. I couldn't figure out. I had to look it up. They had these giant panels that they linked together to build this massive almost all gold structure. And then they would fill it with the stuff and they would cover it with the tent topping, which was leather and skins. Inside were specific pieces of furniture, each with meaning for us today. First is a seven-pointed candle lampstand. You can see it on the diagram there. 75 pounds of pure gold. We did the math. It's $2.4 million dollars for one piece of furniture. You thought Donald Trump's house was expensive. Come on. Okay, it is all gold, and, and this, this is what it means. It says in 1 John 1, 5, this is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare it to you, God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. You see, Jesus was speaking to a group who held the wrong view of God. And he said, guys, if you held the right view of God, you would interact with him in the right way. And so many times we hold the wrong view. He said, no, no, my God isn't here to condemn you. My God isn't here to judge you. My God is light. He's here to enlighten, lift you up, to bring warmth and light into your life. He's here to to speak over you, to breathe his spirit onto you, to build life into you. He's not here for the darkness. He's here to bring light. 
And I wonder if maybe we have the wrong view of God if you're thinking, man, I love God. I, I would love him more if I didn't feel like he was constantly judging me. Maybe you hold the wrong view of God. And it might be in this season, in this year, that God re redefines himself the way that he wants to be defined, the way that he is defining himself as light, as the light bringer. At this station, we ask God for a greater measure, measure of his spirit. We say, God, I know you're endless. Would you give me more of yourself? I want more healing. I want more you speaking over me. I want to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit in greater measure in my life. We ask God to give us more. I have a weekly prayer appointment that I began in 2023. And at my weekly prayer appointment, I pray for all of you. I cover as many as I can, and I cover our church and the leadership in the time that I have, and it's been incredible to see, and this is what I pray for you. I actually uh, lifted it from the Apostle Paul as a pattern for how to pray for the church. He prayed for the church in Ephesians 1. He said this. He said, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you two things spiritual wisdom and insight that you might say this word with me, grow. grow. The 2024 might be a year of growth, that God might give you not worldly wisdom, not worldly insight, but spiritual wisdom, that you might grow in the knowledge of the things of the Spirit, that you might grow in your knowledge of God, that you might begin to experience Him in a brand new way this year. That's my prayer for you when I meet with God. Okay, now after the lampstand, the next station of furniture was a table of bread. Okay, so we walked past the barbecue, washed our hands, opened up the tent, fresh bread. Come on. This God is the God of senses. Okay. And he had on the table 12 loaves of bread, one symbolizing the, uh, each tribe of Israel throughout this. And the 12 loaves were baked fresh every day. The priests would go in. They would minister. They would do all the stuff. They shared a meal. It was awesome. Uh, and this is the deal. When Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. He rebuked Satan, and he said this in Matthew 4, 4. He said, Jesus told him, speaking Satan, no, the scriptures say people don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, from every rhema, from every spoken revelation that God is literally speaking over us. Our sustenance is not food. Our sustenance is spiritual sustenance, that God would give us a word from his Bible, that he would make the word of the Bible come alive. I have a personal story here. When I first got my first Bible. You guys remember your first Bible? In kids' church, we give away excellent Bibles. They're wonderful. So if you have kids here, uh, we would love for them to have a good Bible. My first Bible, my, I think my mom got it for me. It was a, a New King James Version. And I thought for a long time that Shakespeare wrote the Bible. I didn't know. I, 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 was, I got to the end. I was like, wait, Jesus said that? I thought that was Shakespeare. And, it, the, you know, it's, I had a passion for the Bible. Okay, so getting a Bible early gave me a passion for the Bible. But the problem is, is because the language was disconnected, I disconnected from it. And I would encourage you, if your Bible at home is not written in a way that you can interact with it, that you can love it, that you can give it. We have Bibles in the lobby. I would love for you, if you'll take it and read it, it's our gift to you. Take one. You got one you want to give to a friend? Take another one. I would love to see you in this year develop a hunger and a passion for the Word of God. When I reach this section of prayer, I actually pray a specific verse for that season of my life. Okay, so, so God has not just spoken and then the Bible was closed and he's done. God is still speaking today and he gives us verses. He calls out pieces of the Bible to us. And my section right now is in Exodus 33, verse 15. And it says this, it says, then Moses said to him, speaking to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us from here. He said, if your presence goes left, I'm going left. And if it don't go left, I'm not going left. And in 2024, I want a greater measure of God's presence in my life. And so I'm praying this scripture over myself in this time of prayer. And I would encourage each of you, find a verse. If you're at a spot where you're like, man, I don't, I don't even know where to start looking. Come talk to me afterwards. I would love to help you. We can pray and ask God to show a verse to you. I had someone come up to me after first service, and he's like, I didn't even realize it. But I have a verse. It's just been showing up everywhere. God's been trying to tell me, and, and today it clicked. God has a verse for you. 
He has a verse for you. It's a powerful way to release the word of God in your life. The second to last station is an altar of incense, which symbolizes worship and prayer to God. It was an altar where they burned incense 24-7 that lifted up to God. And it's at this section where we pause in our prayer. We're already praying, so we covered the prayer part. But in our prayer, we actually worship God. So I called Caleb, and they're going to come and do a wonderful set for I wouldn't do that to you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it to you. I like how invitational Psalm 95 says it. It, it says it here in Psalm 95, 1 and 2. He says, Come. Let's sing to the Lord. Let's shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let's, let's come to him with some thanksgiving. Let's sing psalms of praise to him. It's like, come on. Let's go together. Let's go worship and praise God. In, in my prayer appointments, oftentimes I'll do this as I'm walking around. I have noise-canceling earbuds in. If you don't have a pair, I highly recommend them. I do two things when I'm worshiping. I worship off-key and off-tempo, okay? And so I'm, Lord, you're good. It's not good. And I realized after a while that I do that sometimes, and there's people around me that I didn't know were there. And I have become the scary guy yelling at himself in the park, like walking around. And it kind of made me wonder, maybe the guy that I've always seen yelling at himself in the park isn't like someone scary. Maybe he's just worshiping. It's possible. I don't know. I don't know. All this is because I followed the prayer model. That's what I want you to see. This is a pattern. And as I began to follow this, I began to have new and, and different expressions. I began to wake up in the morning with worship on my mind. I wake up, and God is already telling me what he wants me to sing to him. I wake up, and God is already saying, come on, son, let's go worship. It's powerful what this can do in your life. Inside the tabernacle tent, behind the thick veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, tent was divided into two areas. The holy place was where the priests went and ministered to God. The holy of holies is where God lived. And inside the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, anybody seen Raider of the, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah, it's awesome. Now, the, the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant on really long poles. So they would put the poles on their shoulders and they would carry it in the middle because they didn't want to touch it. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was the tablets of Moses, and it was a holy place where God lived. And if someone touched it, they almost always, actually, no, I'm going to say, they always died. People were terrified of this thing. That's why they had walls around the outer court, so you didn't wander in and accidentally touch it, because one time that happened, and the two kids died. The reason that they died is not because God's mean. Don't miss this. The reason that they died is because they entered in with sin, and their sin in the presence of a holy God killed them. It blew them apart. The presence of the holy God is something to be feared, something to be in awe of, not afraid like a fear you have of something in life, but an awe and a reverence for. And we talk a lot about how relational we are with God, but we can never remove the fear and wonder at who God is, that he is far above and beyond anything we could understand. And the tabernacle of Moses had a fear and a reverence for the presence of the living God. Now, in Exodus 25, 22, God spoke to Moses and he said, I will meet with you there and I will talk to you from above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that hover over the Ark of the Covenant. From there, I will give you my commands for the people of Israel. God said, I will actually speak to you. I'll give you designs for the future. I'll give you commands for the future. I'll give you moments and, and things that you'll need to say. I'll give you things that you need to do. God gave very specific instructions at the Ark of the Covenant. Here at this station of prayer, we intercede. Intercede is not a word that we use a lot, and so I want to define it for you really quick. It means to intervene on behalf of another. We actually go before and intercede on behalf of another. I told you in 2023, I prayed this prayer a lot. One time in August, as we have a week of prayer, which, by the way, we'll have this year as well, 21 days in the beginning and a week of prayer in August. And during the week of prayer, I was praying this model in this room. And I had the craziest thing happen. Kelsey, go ahead and come on up. The craziest thing happened when during this prayer... I was, I was became, as I was praying, I, I prayed with my eyes closed. Uh, it's not a good model for the prayer team. But as I was praying, I became aware that someone was in the room with me. And I looked up and I was trying to look around and figure out if somebody had like tried to sneak into the church or do something. 
and no one was there. So I went back to praying, and I could just sense and feel that someone was walking in the room. And I became aware that Jesus was in the room with me. And he was walking back and forth. He was pacing in the room. He was pacing in the back rows. And I believe prophetically God was speaking over where he spoke, where he walked when he showed me this in the room, that God wasn't here for people who were already in the front row, already in and locked in, but he was here for the back row people, people who maybe didn't feel totally welcomed by church, people who didn't feel totally accepted by church. And as I walked into the Holy of Holies, I began to pray for those people. In the presence of a living God, I prayed for the people and you have people in your heart people in your life and at your work who don't know Jesus yet. And here in the Holy of Holies, we step in the gap between them and God and we say, Jesus, would you move? God, would you do a work in their lives? I have people, man, I'm like, they need you. If they just knew how bad, if they just knew what God would do with them, how he would speak to them, how he could love them, man, how he could meet with them. If they just got that, how much he loves them. And so here at the, at the Holy of Holies, I want to rest. We've walked through the prayer model. We've, we've actually gotten here. And if you would, just bow your heads for a moment. Let the Holy Spirit call to mind the people in your life that need to meet him so desperately. How about the ones that have met him and just need to see a word from him? Sons and daughters who are now entering into college and high school, and man, they need direction from the living God because they don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't know how they're supposed to act. You got singles looking for a relationship. You got people looking for a job, wondering what's my calling? What is my purpose? What am I here to do? God, how do you want me to live my life? And if they just got that. And so we intercede for them here, God. We ask you to do a work in, in, in their lives. We ask you for a work in Central Oregon, that this would be a moment that begins the rest of the year, a movement in the rest of the year, flowing in your spirit the rest of the year. We're in a holy moment. And for some of you, it's a divine appointment. You know that God is not interacting in the way that then maybe you want him to. Your relationship with God isn't maybe the way that you wish it was. Maybe you're at a point where you're saying, man, those those prayer people, they're crazy. But I kind of want to be like them. I want to have a relationship with God like that. What I'm doing isn't working. I feel like I'm just spinning my wheels. Life isn't happening the way that it's supposed to. And I know that something is missing. And if that's you, the thing that is missing is Jesus. And we're right here in a holy moment. And I don't want to miss it. You're one prayer away from God being accepted into your life and changing everything. And if that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want you to slip your hand up. I see you. to pray this prayer with me. Just repeat after me. Some of you are praying this for the very first time. And, and then when we finish and when we close out, we're going we're gonna to jump with joy because it says the heavens are erupting with a, a party like never before. So pray this with me. God, I love you. I need you. I turn from everything that I was doing. And I step into new life with you. I set down my dreams and hopes and turn my life over to you. It's yours now. And you can do with it whatever you want. Be the Lord of my life. Guide me. Lead me. I submit to you, Jesus. 
I accept your gift in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, would you guys lift your hands for the people who prayed that for the very first time today? Amen. It's awesome. It's awesome. So good. Your guys' next step, don't miss it. Don't leave here without it. Get in a group. And if you can't get in a group and you're like, man, it's a bit much, my schedule's crazy, make a prayer appointment. I'm going to give you three thoughts on this and then I'll let you go. Make it, keep it, and make it work for you, okay? 